Good morning and welcome to the Oakmont Sunday Symposium. Our guest today is Dr. Andy Merrifield of Sonoma State, uh, who will be talking to us about the upcoming election for the president in this crazy environment we're in combining uh, an unusual pair of people running for president alongside of this COVID-19 crisis. Um, we will be having a Q&A with uh, Dr. Merrifield uh, at 11 a.m. on Sunday, and there will be instructions on the website about how to access both this video and also how to access uh, that Q&A. So with that as the introduction, Dr. Merrifield. Thank you, George. Um, uh, yeah, as, as George pointed out, I am an emeritus professor in political science at Sonoma State University. Um, my major areas of uh, concentration were the U.S. presidency, uh, modern political ideas, uh, methodology, and um, even some U.S. history, um, since I also have a master's degree in that. I want to start off as an introduction saying I have never done a presentation on Zoom before, um, and it, this is a bit awkward for me um, in doing presentations. Um, I've always been talking to somebody or some group of people and looking at people other than me. Um, so this makes it, uh, uh, please bear with me. Um, I love looking out at an audience. I'm not so crazy about looking out at me. So I hope this doesn't ruin anything or make this more boring, uh, et cetera, than I would hope. Um, the other thing I want to tell you is because of the nature of what we're the presentation and because we're going to have a Q&A, uh, much of my presentation is going to be quite bare bones, which means that um, at the end, there may be things that you think, well, I didn't go deep enough into, and you will be absolutely correct. And I encourage you, therefore, um, to delve, ask me to delve deeper, make me clarify, etc. Uh, it'll make for a much better Q&A. Um, this is live, but it is not unrehearsed since I have been studying this material um, from the time I started college until I retired, well, and up to today for well over a half a century. Um, okay, let's just start right out by looking at presidential elections in general, and then we'll start to move into focus on this particular presidential election. Um, the first thing is, is that all presidential elections are unique. Um, there are always differences from one year to another. Um, you have different people with different characters, with different outlooks, with different strengths and different weaknesses, and you have different issues uh, to confront, um, both internationally and nationally. So in that sense, um, whatever the election is, it would be unique. Um, but still, this is the 58th time the United States has used this method in selecting the chief executive, and over 58 times in uh, 200 and almost 30 years um, we've been doing this. Um, there have been a lot of uh, generalizations that we can adhere to or embrace. Um, and I want to touch on some of those fairly quickly. Uh, first, um, incumbents like to run for re-election if they are still eligible. Um, we have had, in the entire history of the country, uh, three people elected president promised in advance they would not run for re-election, um, and that was Polk, Buchanan, and Hayes. So it's 1880 was the last time somebody completely voluntarily who could have run bowed out. We've had four others that bowed out a little bit later along the way. Um, including some fairly recent ones. Um, President Arthur claimed that he was unwell, but uh, he wouldn't have got a nomination. Uh, President Truman said that he was decided not to run, um, but the New Hampshire primary had already taken place and he hadn't done very well. And the same thing can be said for Lyndon Johnson um, when he decided not to run in 1968. Um, it didn't look like he was going to get the nomination. Really, only Calvin Coolidge, who never promised originally not to run for president, um, and then voluntarily bailed out. Um, others who have bailed out were vice presidents who inherited the office and weren't going to get the nomination anyway. So, and I bring this up because from the day they enter the White House, or maybe from the day they get elected and it's confirmed 
presidents are always thinking about re-election. Um, and that leads us to a second general point. Re-elections, you know, whenever, when there is an incumbent running, re-elections are always about the incumbent, okay? Um, I've seen people try and figure that out and estimate, but let's say 90 to 95% of a re-election election, election um, is about the incumbent because they have a record, not the challenger. So the challenger's job is to try and make it about themselves and at the same time um, accentuate the differences to improve their own position. Um, <clears throat> the next point of a, of a generalization is elections are usually about two macro issues. Um, peace, and by peace I mean that uh, we aren't in a war where a lot of Americans are dying. Um, if you look at American history, we seem to be at war uh, more often than not, and that's actually accurate. I mean, we have troops someplace an awful lot of the time, but for war to make a difference, there have to be a lot of American casualties to kind of catch our attention. Um, and the other one is the pocketbook. It's economics always plays a role um, and so to simplify, peace in the pocketbook are always going to be there. Um, but then to quote John Lennon, life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. So there's always a third issue um, possible in any election. And that's something that happened that you hadn't planned on. And in a sense, this election really focuses on that third point um, to a substantial degree. Um, Another point, general point, is elections are about the Electoral College, um, much more than about the electoral vote. Um, the reality is that um, the Electoral College is not democratic with a small d, and it actually hasn't been democratic with a large d either. Um, I mean, for example, California has 55 electors and 40 million people. Uh, Wyoming has three electors and 600,000 people, which means that um, they have one and a half percent um, the population and they have about 5% or 6% of the Electoral College, which means a vote in Wyoming is worth about three times as much as a vote in California in some senses. Um, in every election where the person with the most votes has lost in the Electoral College, um, it has been to the advantage of the Republican Party and to say how important the Electoral College has become um, in the 21st century, the Republicans have won the vote 20% of the time, and they've inaugurated 60% of the time. So that's what you concentrate on when you're creating an electoral strategy to get reelected, or an electoral strategy to um, just get elected for the first time. Um, and then also on this same point, elections are won on the margins. Um, the vast majority of people who intend to vote um, have pretty much made up their mind which way they're going. So elections concentrate on how can we tweak, how can we get the differences. Um, and so campaigns don't run necessarily on big general themes, but on smaller themes from time to time. Um, two, la two last points. One is that a three-peat, um, one party winning three elections in a row is very rare. That's not happening in this election. Um, the last time the uh, Democrats won a three-peat was in 1948, um, and the Republicans have won a third term in a row once in the last 92 years, and that's when George H.W. Bush followed Ronald Reagan. So it is very, very difficult to win three in a row, but this is a two-in-a-row kind of an election. Okay, so those is background. Um, I want to go back to once I said, I mentioned I was a methodologist, and as a methodologist, I have to point out that um, the best way to predict the future is to look in the past, and I don't know what that's going to do for us in this election, because this is a very different election. So let's start with the incumbent, um, Donald Trump. The economy was going to be the firewall for President Trump, um, because Donald Trump is the most unpopular president in modern American history when he has a moderately to good economy. Um, 
the numbers are striking um, in the sense that um, Nixon, Carter, Clinton, George W. Bush all came to the White House with less than 50% of the vote, but well over 50% of the support at the time of their inauguration, and it varied somewhat. Um, Donald Trump has never really had 50% of the support of the American people at any time um, based on any conglomeration of polls. Um, there is one polling agency that tends to put him much, much higher than everybody else. And even with that poll, um, he rarely gets to 50%. But he had the stock market, which looked very good. Employment numbers looked good, um, though insecurity among working people was still very real, even in the last three years, and inequality continues to grow. Um, and both of those work somewhat against being a truly great economy. Um, but if you use the stock market and unemployment figures, it was pretty good. Um, and then the virus COVID-19 hit. Um, and COVID-19 could have looked at the beginning like a war. He tried to put it into war terms using a war analogy once he recognized that it was going to be a problem. Um, but it never quite had the same cachet that other presidents have gotten out of wars or war metaphors or other things. I mean, for example, in March when President Trump started working to um, fight this war against the virus, um, he got a slight boop, bump up of about 6%. Um, to put that in context, Jimmy Carter got a bump greater than that when he sent the helicopters out into the desert and they crashed into each other in 1980, a complete disaster. Um, by comparison, um, George W. Bush got a bump of about 40 to 50 percent as a result of the attacks of September 11, 2001. So he did get a bump, but it wasn't much and it didn't last very long. So, so far, the war analogy of COVID-19 is not working to his advantage. Um, of course, with the huge loss of lives, um, it is working uh, strongly against him in that sense, and that will become um, a potential problem perhaps as we go along. It also allows him, however, if he can figure out how to reverse this situation um, and look like a strong leader who's in charge and he can bring the numbers down and he can start to get the economy going again, et cetera, um, those leadership qualities could serve him very, very well. But at the moment, the virus is not helping him. Um, and of course, since it also um, has been responsible for uh, the latest figures I saw today, the unemployment is now about 36 million as 3 million more people applied for unemployment. This is, um, I'm sorry, Thursday morning. Um, the other thing about uh, Donald Trump is running for president is he is running a campaign that I think is unique. And I say think because I can't, come up with any campaign based on the belief that the best way to run is not only to only engage your base, um, i.e. my supporters matter, but to treat those who are not in your base, not with the term popularized back in the Nixon administration of how Nixon was gonna treat African Americans with benign neglect, um, but Trump is treating those who he don't, doesn't think of as in his base um, with something much more like malice. And so to run a hostile election against everybody except those that you already have uh, is a unique form of running for president. And now that he is the president as opposed to the challenger, um, that makes for a, a virtually unique reelection campaign. Um, I wanna look at what I consider the base for Donald Trump. Um, and of course, there will be overlaps and oversimplifications, and I'll be glad to clarify later. Um, he really consists of four groups. Um, the populist right. And what I mean by the populist right is um, the first quality of them is they're virtually, they're just overwhelmingly white. Um, as a general group, the populist right is less educated than the national average. Um, they're much more likely to be rural than suburban um, or urban. Um, many of them face massive economic uncertainty. Um, they have jobs that go away. They don't have the careers they planned on having. 
shipping, um, the coal mine shut down, um, ways of doing business that they used to have, they don't do anymore. Businesses have been moved over to uh, outside the country to Latin America, Asia, or someplace else. So they face economic uncertainty, unlike what their parents did. Um, many of them are extremely and overtly anti-urban. They don't like cities and they're anti-cosmopolitan. And by cosmopolitan, I don't mean cities. I mean cosmopolitan in literal sense, citizens of the world. Um, they don't like um, things that they see as outside the American norm. Um, so they sometimes are highly nationalistic. And finally, to a substantial group of the populist right, certainly not all of them, because this is all generalizations, um, guns equal freedom. Um, the single biggest issue for many of them really does center around guns because that's their protection. Um, the second coalition that is um, was with Donald Trump in the election of, of 2016 are older voters. Um, older voters, like the populist right, um, are concerned about change. Um, they are the highest, they, they vote with the highest numbers, um, but they're not nearly as loyal um, to Donald Trump. And as I'll speak about in a moment, um, they are have become the the least loyal of his uh, original coalition. In 2016, um, voters the, over the age of 65 um, gave a 9% uh, bump to Donald Trump over Hillary Rodham Clinton. Um, but as I say, their turnout is very, very high. And I'll get to that, come back to that in a minute. The third group are suburban voters. Um, the suburban voters played a key role in places like um, um, Pennsylvania, um, and Wisconsin, etc. These suburban voters um, tend to be people who were like the economics of traditional republicanism um, to a substantial degree, um, and a lot of them disliked um, Hillary Rodham Clinton. Many of them also disliked Donald Trump, but um, in the last election, if you had what were known as, and this is a bad term, the haters, they disliked both candidates by about 17%, they favored Donald Trump over Hillary Rodham Clinton, which isn't surprising. Um, if you don't like what's going on, you don't like the incumbent, and Clinton was sort of the stand-in for the incumbency. Um, they also worry about economic uncertainty. Um, the soccer moms of 30 years ago have become more prone to concerns about walls than soccer, and they're also, because of their economic uncertainty, again, vis-a-vis -vis what it used to be. Um, they are not generally comfortable. A lot of the suburban supporters of Donald Trump are not comfortable with his um, overt bigotry, um, his statements about African Americans, his statements about um, Latinx people, his statements about uh, various groups. Um, and many of them are um, not anti-choice. They are pro-choice. Um, but uh, by and large, they gave, a they gave him a bump uh, four years ago. And finally, there's the fundamentalist Christians and the conservative Catholics. Um, there is some overlap between them and the populist right, but they're a different group. Um, they supported him because they don't like the democratic positions on issues like um, abortion, same-sex marriage, etc. Um, but many of them have become somewhat uncomfortable with his vehement anti-immigration stuff. Um, many of them are deeply disturbed by what they perceived as caging children. Um, and many of them are uncomfortable with his uh, anti-Muslim stuff. Um, but they still support he's done a fine job as far as they're concerned on appointing judges that they believe may do away with Roe versus Wade. Um, this coalition is coming into a huge clash as a result of what happened with the COVID um, at, uh, pandemic because it's pitting some of those suburban voters um, who were feeling pretty good about Trump even at the beginning of this year despite not liking his some of his positions um, but the stock market looked good if you had uh, stocks and bonds, or if you had IRAs, uh, everything was looking fairly good. Then you had 
the drop in the stock market. And even with the recovery of the last couple of months, the market is still down um, probably 20 to 25 percent. Um, and since they were sticking with him because of that, um, they're not so sure uh, about him anymore. Um, and they did like the tax cuts, but now with the closing down of the economy and the coming of what could be the deepest recession or even a depression, um, they're looking for him, okay, this is a problem, you've got to get us out of this. Um, in 1928, it may, or 1929, it may not have been Herbert Hoover who created the depression, but he didn't get him out and he got killed in 1932. Um, and so that's a problem. So they want, a lot of these suburban people want to reopen the economy very quickly, um, and that puts them in direct conflict with the older voters. Um, the older voters by six to one, according to most polls, um, see COVID as a healthcare issue, not as an economic issue. And they are not interested in opening up early. They see it as dangerous um, and they see it as callous. Um, and the latest polls show that whereas Donald Trump won the older voters by about 9% uh, four years ago, he is, it is now the group that he is the most unpopular with except for youth. And he has no support of substantial numbers under youth. So um, that hurts him. Uh, as I said, the cr Christian groups are still with him on abortion. Um, they like that. They're still with him on um, his hostility to, for example, um, transsexuals in the military. Those things work with him, but they do have a lack of enthusiasm for what they see as a sort of coarseness, and he has proved to be the least conversant person claiming to be um, a defender of Christian values of any presidential candidate or president in modern times. His knowledge of scriptures and holy text um, is cringeworthy to a lot of them. So they're, they're less dedicated to him. It's not, in this group, it's not so much that they're gonna switch necessarily and vote for Democrats, although um, Joe Biden uh, may have some appeal, especially with Catholics, considering his own background. Um, but there's a lack of enthusiasm for him this time compared to four years ago. Um, on the other hand, the Christian, or the, I'm sorry, the populist right hasn't moved at all. Um, they're still with him. Um, a substantial number of them believe that COVID is a hoax or it came from China. Uh, they continue to be enthusiastic for him, but whether they're large enough to win or not, that is somewhat problematic. Um, and there could be some waning of enthusiasm because a lot of the lower income populist right are the ones that are really getting clobbered by this economics. And if he does push to open and it does reopen and A, deaths go up or B, it doesn't really help them. Enthusiasm may wane. Again, this group is not probably going to switch to the Democrats, but enthusiasm matters too. Um, and so as we look at it, Trump with a bad economy and an early opening may drastically push the older voters out. And it should be noted that if you use older, not old, but older voters starting at age 50, um, that was 56% of all the voters in the last election. And if you move up to 65, that's still 27% of all of the voters in the last election was 65 or over. So if he loses a substantial chunk of them and can't hold on to the suburban ones, he has some problems. Now let me spend just a couple of minutes um, talking about his almost certain opponent, um, former Vice President Joe Biden. Um, Joe Biden is not what I would call a great candidate. Um, he is, uh, was very strong among African-American activists who delivered big in South Carolina and helped with the sweep. Um, he's very much of the old guard um, of the Democratic Party. Um, they went to Joe Biden because they knew him. Um, most of the old guard of the Democratic Party can't stand Bernie Sanders because Bernie Sanders, face it, isn't a Democrat. Um, even he's run for president twice as a Democratic Party, but before he goes into a primary, he isn't even a member of the party necessarily. And many of the old guard Democrats who are very concerned about losing 
um, the business community, of which the Democrats don't get as much as the Republicans, but the business community works with both sides. Um, the business community probably dislikes Elizabeth Warren as much as any major candidate of the Democratic Party since Franklin Roosevelt. And so Biden was a safe, well-known um, guy. Um, like George H.W. Bush, he's sort of filling out his resume, he'd done everything, now it's time to be president. But um, he was even, Biden is more wedded to Obama than George H.W. Bush was wedded to Reagan. Um, there's no kinder, gentler, there's no, I'm the same as, but, it's Joe Biden is um, Barack Obama in much of his positions, which is a little difficult because Barack Obama said if he was running now, he wouldn't run the same campaign he did 16 years ago. Um, and the delay of one cycle, the waiting four years, makes Biden a little weaker because he can't ride the coattails of a very popular President Obama as he left office. Um, the other problem with Biden is an enthusiasm gap. Um, people talked about the enthusiasm gap um, in 2016, but didn't really hit on it. It really exists, apparently. Um, the enthusiasm gap simply means that I'm not going to vote for the other guy, and it's always a guy, except for Hillary, um, but I'm just not going to vote at all. And the enthusiasm gap made a difference in pivotal states um, for Hillary Rodham Clinton, um, especially among African Americans. Um, he has a very strong support with African Americans who are activists. Uh, we don't know how it's going to work out with the African Americans who loved Barack Obama in some state home. Um, it's like a lot, there was a large group of African Americans who loved Bill Clinton, but they stayed home for Al Gore. Um, and it's not just the African Americans, even more important for Joe Biden, the enthusiasm gap with younger voters. As I said before, most of the polls show younger voters cannot stand Donald Trump on a lot of issues, but they have no enthusiasm for Joe Biden either. And younger voters are the lowest voter turnout of almost any way you cut and slice and dice voting blocks. So that could be an issue um, for him. He simply doesn't inspire them. And many of them are still angry um, about the situation with Senator Sanders. Um, and to a lesser degree with Senator Warren. Another problem with him is, with Joe Biden, is he is prone to gaps. And these gaps are, have nothing to do um, with as he got older. You go back and look at Joe Biden, and he's had gaps his entire political career, and he has a 50 year political career. So if you want to dig up dirt on somebody, if you've got 50 years of stuff, you're going to find stuff more easily. Uh, Two last points on this before I sort of summarize. Um, never before has a vice presidential selection seemed as important. Um, Biden saying it's going to be a woman has been good with him with the Democratic Party and probably doesn't hurt him too much with the general election. Those who don't want a woman to be president or vice president um, aren't going to vote for him anyway. Um, but in picking a vice president, there's issues of age, ethnicity, experience. Um, Joe Biden will be 80 years old halfway through his first term. Um, and there will be holdovers. COVID and the ec economy are not going to be in perfect shape um, anytime real soon. Uh, African Americans seem to be demanding, in some cases, a quid pro quo. Not only does it have to be a woman, it has to be an African American woman. Um, and that gets down to um, Harris. Kamala Harris and Stacey Abrams. Harris looks good, but much on, people on the left don't necessarily trust her. Um, she, after all, DA Attorney General. Um, and to some, she seems a little harsh. Um, Abrams is a star in the making. She's a terrific organizer, and she's never won anything behind, besides um, a small election in Georgia. Um, and if it becomes too much pandering, in picking the vice president, especially if the African Americans make too great a demands, it could alienate other important groups in the Democratic coalition, including the Latinx, um, who have their own demands and their own desires. Um, so this could be problematic. No matter what he does on the vice presidency, um, he could hit a home run 
or he could strike out for sure. Uh, and then a final issue facing um, Biden that makes him less than great candidate is the issue of Tara Reid. Um, at this point, many people are lining up behind Biden. Um, and the case certainly, uh, Tara Reid's case against Biden certainly doesn't have the strength um, as, say, the case against Kavanaugh or even the case against Trump. But the hypocrisy is real. Democrats really did say, believe all women, um, which was a dumb thing to say. What they should have said is, listen to all women, investigate all women, and believe women that are believable. Whether Tara Reid is believable or not at this point, it, she hasn't made a great case, but we've still got a lot of time to the convention until November. And then, of course, the final point in any election, whether it's Donald Trump against Joe Biden, um, or two stronger candidates is an October surprise. And an October surprise can either be something that the president can plan because he's in power, or it can be something that is truly a surprise. I mean, after all, we are suffering now, and we're suffering greatly from a winter 2020 surprise to COVID-19. We saw it coming. We didn't know how bad it was going to be. And it doesn't appear as if the United States government prepared to handle it very well compared to the rest of the world. And that has altered the election significantly for the president and for uh, former Vice President Biden. So with that as background, a couple of last points, not about these two, but again, getting back to generalizations. Process matters um, in elections. The vote by mail issue. Um, I see where the Texas courts just said that you can't for, allow otherwise healthy people to vote by mail just because they're concerned if voting in person might impinge on public health. Um, that's a position that seems a little strange in California, but Texas, remember, has a huge number of electoral votes too, and they're pretty much going to go to Donald Trump, but they're there. Uh, voter suppression continues. There's no question that um, President Trump's comment that if we got if everybody got a right to everybody actually went out and voted, you'd never elect another Republican, maybe slightly overstated. But the reality is that um, the Republicans in numerous states where they have controlled things have tried to make it more difficult to vote, um, and with some good results on their part, and with the Supreme Court overturning much of the Voting Rights Act. That will be could be significant again in 2020. And then finally, everybody wants to start off talking about this, and that is money. Um, Trump will have far more money than Biden, but Biden will have enough money. Money is necessary, but not sufficient. You don't win just because you have the most. Um, you can win as long as you have enough. Trump will have more. Biden should have enough. So money may not be quite as important. Um, nor will the mainstream media play quite the role some people give it. Um, when thinking about the media, think about it this way. The media doesn't really tell us what to think, but it really does tell us what we're going to think about. And most of us self-select in the news. Um, whether we read newspapers or watch television or go online, um, we tend to look for positive reinforcement. So the media matters about what we're going to talk about. But those people who are going to be influenced on, by Fox are going to be influenced by Fox because that's what they choose to watch. Those people who are going to be influenced by MSNBC are the same thing. Um, you go to the people who say, see, I believe that. And when they say things you don't believe, as last night when they asked a question on Fox about Obamagate and the lawyer said, there's nothing there, those people who watch Fox every day, they didn't hear that. Okay? And those people who listen to, say, Rachel Maddow every day, um, they hear what reinforces their thinking. And that's why they go to Rachel Maddow in the first place. But the media is going to still be a major focus. Uh, so where are we? Two unpopular candidates. Um, according to, as I said, I think the recent polling data, if you dislike both candidates, um, that worked for Trump last time. The recent one showing if you dislike both candidates, um, by about a 40% margin, they're going for Biden. On the other hand, if you like both candidates, you're still slightly going to go for Trump. Uh, how does that balance out? If the election were today, it would be one thing. 
But remember the first thing about polls, the elections aren't today. We don't know what it'll mean in six months. Elections are, um, polls are snapshots, campaigns are motion pictures. Um, the populist right faction doesn't seem to be moving, but are they big enough? Um, the anybody but Trump faction isn't going to move, but are they big enough? And are they enthusiastic enough? Um, and finally, besides the October surprise, this will be the first time since television that the campaign for president to a substantial degree at this point is what they used to call a front porch strategy. Now it's a basement strategy or a White House strategy. The candidates won't be out pressing, pressing the flesh at the same rates. President Trump may do that. I think Biden will be more cautious. So what we have is a campaign that is unique because of the way the president is running it, unique because of the COVID virus. Um, many trends still are there, but the trends are different. Um, and so it would be easy to predict based on national polls that if the election were held today, Joe Biden would win. But again, the election won't be held today. And if you looked at the polls just before the election of 2016, Hillary Clinton was going to win on the popular vote, and she did, but she's not president of the United States. So I thank you. I look forward to questions and answers. And I know this is bare bones, and please ask for any clarification um, or make any corrections about my thinking you want to. And thanks again.